this is my fourth year of coming to speak to the National Association of Pension Funds Conference. And Joanne, can I say firstly um, how delighted I am that Bob Geldof agreed to be my warm-up act. I am too old, as you suggest, too young, as you suggested earlier, to remember the Boomtown Rats. My memories of Bob Geldof are more around uh, Live Aid and uh, the famous song. But from what I've heard, he was a great success in taking up a pensions brief very quickly, which is something I had to do myself uh, four years ago now, nearly. And in those four years, Joanne, as you suggested in your introduction, there has been a lot of activity. And I would like, as I go on in my observations, to suggest perhaps there's been too much activity. But at the same time, I think that myself and Labour colleagues have to take some of the inverted commas culpability. Because I think in some of the most important areas where the government is acting, they have done so under significant pressure from the official opposition. So let me say, I think appropriately, as we approach a general election at this, the last NEPF annual conference before the election, let me say out where I think the pensions landscape stands at this stage and how it's changed over the last four years. And let me divide that analysis into a number of parts. These parts, I would suggest, are firstly areas where there have been significant successes based, I would argue, on cross-party consensus. Secondly, areas where the government, under pressure from the Labour Party, also from the National Association of Pension Funds, and indeed from many people and organisations in this room today, areas where the government has, in name so far, taken action, but not actually in practice, and they have to be held um, to those promises, indeed the, the implementation of um, reform in those areas. Thirdly, areas where actually the government finds itself, I think, in the wrong place. And I'll say more about that. And fourthly, and most topically, areas where the government is acting decisively, but it seems without due regard to getting checks and balances in place to ensure that reforms in this area um, are effective. So that all sounds a little enigmatic, so let me get down to the detail. Firstly, the areas of success, it seems to me very obvious that the, the two most successful developments of the pensions landscape um, since 2010 have been in the areas of the development of a flat rate state pension, which I would describe as a, a rapid acceleration by this government of an approach which had taken root under the previous government, but absolutely a rapid acceleration by the present administration towards a flat rate pension and the advantages that does bring um, in the pensions sphere. I think as importantly and related to that, of course, is the rollout of auto-enrolment. Absolutely critical. More than 4 million people so far auto-enrolled. I'm delighted about, of course, from a pensions point of view, but also delighted because it was, of course, something which... Um, had its gestation under the previous Labour government and was more widely, and this goes for the state pension reform as well, part of that consensus that was built over the last decade or so. And that consensus has found its fruition in, in both these excellent policies. Now, a word about auto-enrolment. Of course, we have to be careful not to indulge in too much self-congratulation. It was always said, I think, by everyone in the know that in the end, the most difficult part of the auto-enrolment process would be when the much smaller employers came to automatically enrol. Now, currently, we're still in that 50 to 250 tranche, I believe. But by December of next year, post-general election, we will be into the 30 and under category. And my understanding is that there's, there's no staging within that staging, i.e. it's everyone, every business that's 30 or under, whatever it's actual employee size has to enrol in that process and in no particular order. And that does represent a big challenge. And there is a danger, and this takes one back to the issue around potentially too much, um, too many things being produced from the centre without due regard for those that have to implement these changes. That does bring, bring us back to that point. 
because we cannot afford, in my opinion, and I say we as uh, those in the pensions world, those interested in pensions and certainly government, we cannot afford to take our eye off the auto-enrollment ball. It's of course absolutely critical to ensure that the smaller employers, of whom there are many, and employ many millions of people, get this right. And when I say they have to get it right, smaller employers have to be helped to get it right by the state, by pensions industry, and by everyone with an interest in ensuring auto enrollment success. So I think we cannot take our eye off that ball. And the flurry of, the flurry of activity, um, some of it I think more worthwhile than others, potentially puts that process in some sort of doubt. So I think that's a cautionary note. Now on to the areas where I think the government has particularly under pressure from myself and my colleagues and from the NEPF and others, um, taken action in name now, but hasn't implemented that action yet and where the devil will be in the detail, of course. An obvious example is a charge cap. Another obvious example is transaction costs. Now it was quite striking to me that at last year's NEPF conference, the pensions minister um, gave us his song from Les Miserables. Unfortunately, I, I missed that performance. But subsequent to that, I found myself in an alliance that I would never have expected to be in, certainly as a young man uh, growing up with a, a great dislike of the, of the Thatcher governments. I found myself in agreement with Nigel Lawson and working to the same ends uh, last year as, the, as that pensions bill went forward. And under that pressure um, from that um, alliance, the government has undertaken, it appears, to ensure the disclosure of transaction costs. But it's not quite as simple as it appears, of course, because what the government has done is give that power, it says, to the FCA. But actually, the FCA has always had the power to force disclosure. It's just not chosen to use that power. And in those areas of actually what the charge cap covers, what the disclosure of transaction costs covers in those sorts of areas, the government must deliver in substance, not just in name. Now, the third area that I suggested was worth reflecting on is an area in which the government is in the wrong position. And in my view, is not close to getting things right. And for me, that's governance. And within the governance sphere, the issue of trustee governance and independent governance committees. Now, again, I would say that the report from the, the report into pensions, which was undertaken not so long ago, of which we're all very aware, and which really exposed some of the issues in the pensions industry, led very quickly to the adoption by the government of independent governance committees. But the issue there is actually beyond that name, beyond that label, how independent are these committees and what are they governing? My view is that as long as contract-based pension schemes are not governed by trustees with a fiduciary duty to act in the interests of savers, but instead their governance depends on a management of the tension between the duty to deliver for shareholders and the obligation to treat customers fairly, as long as they continue to be governed on that basis, then we're unlikely to see the value for money in workplace pensions, which should be the sine qua non, in my view, in Labour's view of pensions policy. So I think in governance, absolutely critical, and specifically on the issue of independent governance committees, the government is not in the right place. Pension schemes of all kinds should be governed by independent trustees with a, a legal obligation to act in the saver's interest. That seems to me the, the best possible solution which is available. I also suggested an area of policy in which the government has moved dramatically, but not necessarily um, putting in place the kind of checks and balances that we need to see. And of course, I refer to the budget reforms which take up much of any discussion of pensions these days. 
I mean, it really is pretty striking that so close to the implementation date when all this goes live, pension providers, pension professionals, everyone in the pensions industry is still seeking even the most basic clarity around the way in which these reforms are going to work. The guidance guarantee is absolutely critical. Um, it has to work not just effectively as guidance and as a, a model for the delivery of guidance, but ensuring that the take-up is such that actually that guidance uh, reaches those who will need um, to go through that process. And so far, we neither know what the guidance will look like, nor have we any real idea, idea or rather any reassurance that the take-up um, by individuals is likely to be high enough to drive these changes forward in a positive fashion. And I was striking yesterday in the Osborne's attempt to rehash something that was already in the draft bill and package it in a way which was at odds with actually um, what the reform amounts to. The beginning of a backlash amongst professionals and uh, professionals in the media too. And I think that's because, although there's a recognition that the annuities industry was not operating effectively, and again, I can't, um, I can't complain about the changes insofar as it was clear to me that the annuities industry was broken as things stand, and also that more flexibility and options for savers was a good thing. That seems to me um, a reasonable assessment. But all that being said, there are dangers here which the government must address. A system of checks and balances must be put in place um, and put in place rapidly given the start date so that we can all have some reassurance about how this whole policy is going to proceed. So there are areas I think that the pensions landscape can be defined in, in terms of over the last four years. Labour's priorities I set out at this conference last year, and indeed some of them the year before, having spent some time um, analysing the industry and coming to my own conclusions, and they really remain the same. My view is that the things that matter fundamentally, and certainly as Pensions Minister, my absolute priority would be to achieve value for money in all workplace pension schemes. Now that's easy to say, and is a short statement, but much more difficult to achieve and would take some, indeed a lot of work. And here's what I think needs to be done. Firstly, throughout everything that government does in that area, there has to be a focus on the promotion of scale. Because the suggestions I make and the policies I propose around a trustee-based model of governance, around an effective charge cap, around the disclosure of transaction costs, not just um, for its own sake, but also as a tool for effective governance, for an automatic transfer system based on aggregators rather than, I think, the doomed portfolios member model. For all those things, and of course, removing the nest restrictions, something which I have argued for two years now, there was no impediment under European law and which I'm gratified to see has belatedly been confirmed by the government. The removal of the nest restrictions is part of that process too. It's clear to me, and I know it's something the NEPF has long argued, that larger pension schemes are on the whole more likely to be able to deliver value for money on these bases. And that's at the centrepiece of Labour's approach. Now, a bit like London buses, just as one pensions bill disappears over the horizon, another two appear. And my Treasury colleagues will, I think, from the week after next, be into the second reading and further discussions about the budget changes. And we will be seeking the clarity on the implementation of these reforms that I know so many people here today are after. And that's very important. At the same time, I will be taking on the pension schemes bill and the issues around collective defined contribution. I say I welcome the, this bill.
to the extent that anything which encourages a conversation about the advantages of scaling and larger pension schemes seems to me a good thing. It's certainly where I think the action needs to be. So, Joanne, conference, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you again this year. I don't think anyone can again say that pensions is boring. There have been many changes. I think we find, it'd be interesting to compare notes with those that have been around longer than myself, that pensions seems to be top of the, the political and media agenda more than it ever has been. And I think that reflects the increasing importance of pensions, not just in terms of an aging society and, and in, a renewed emphasis on saving, but actually that we have via auto enrolment a new mass pensions savings industry. I predict that pensions will only become more important in politics, more important in the public's um, perception of politics. And for that basis, I suspect that the NEPF, the pensions industry, and all those who work within it are not, go not only going to enjoy even more scrutiny, but also greater opportunities to actually make this country and its pensions and savings culture stronger and better. Thank you very much.